And I want to, um, I've been remiss because I haven't been saying good morning. We haven't been saying good morning to the people who are joining us uh, on Facebook and YouTube. So, Caitlin, is it possible to turn the camera around? Is that, can we spin it around the other way or is that going to break, the, <laughs> break things if we do that? I just thought we could all wish everybody good morning who's joining us. Is that going to work? Okay, on three, we're going to say good morning. One, two, three. Good morning. Okay, thank you. I just, I just think we shouldn't leave out the people who are joining us online. So, um, I have just a very few announcements this morning. Um, council will meet today at two. Um, youth will meet today at four. Um, and a quick reminder that the Larry Rogers scholarship applications are still available until May 30th. Um, we are looking for a VBS director. Um, if you or someone you know would like to do that, please contact Janila uh, in the church office. Uh, she says our theme this year is going to be Rainforest Explorers. Uh, lastly, on a sad note, please keep uh, the Bost family in your prayers. Beth Lackey passed away uh, this morning. Um, and I don't have any details. We don't really know what has happened, but please keep the Boss family in your prayers. And um, does anyone else have any other announcements this morning? All right, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives us all our sin and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people and turn us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. Hear our truth, sorrow, and let us be forgiven. Save us, Lord, from the hands of the Lord, and in your compassion, forgive us our sins, and all of your own love. The things we have done and the things we have failed to do, turn us again to you. God, who was rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power of the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
God our Creator and Redeemer, your Son Jesus prayed that his followers might be one. Make all Christians one with him as he is one with you, so that in peace and concord we may carry to the world the message of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Come on up, boys and girls. Somebody might give you a cake with candles on it. You blow out what? Birthdays. I think we all like to celebrate birthdays. Last Sunday, you all helped all the women in this congregation celebrate a special day when you gave the red rose. Mother's Day. And next month will be Father's Day. And a month after that, this faith, this faith town will be decorated in red, white, and blue for what special day? The Fourth of July. That's right. There are lots of special days to celebrate. But I wonder if you know that there's one day that is so special that we don't celebrate it just for one day. We celebrate it for 50 days. Did you say, does anybody know what's the day to celebrate for 50 days? I, well, it could be. I've got a hint for you. This might help. What does this make you think of? Easter. Did you know that Easter is so special? We celebrate Easter for 50 days. Today is day 43. Next Sunday will be day 50 when we celebrate Pentecost. Why do you think Easter is so special to us Christians? You know, you say, you know, you know, it's when what? What happened special on Easter Sunday? What did Jesus do special on Easter? On Good Friday, he died on the cross, and then on the third day, on Easter day, he rose again from the dead. And do you know why that's so special for us? When he rose again from the dead, he opened up the way to heaven for everybody who believes in him. So that we know that even these old bodies we've got might get old and sick and die, that Jesus has the power and loves us enough to raise us up from the dead and take us to heaven forever with him. That's why we celebrate Easter for 50 days. But that's not all. Do you know that we Lutherans say that Easter is so special to us that really every Sunday when we come to worship, we celebrate like a little mini Easter. Did you know that? And did you think about coming to worship every Sunday as being a celebration? It is. Think about some of the things we said we do when we celebrate. Remember I said we gather together with our family and friends and people we love. Haven't we done that? Don't we do that every Sunday? There are decorations. Look at the special decorations that are still in our worship space because it is Easter season. Those white lilies you see are not there just because. They're there because it's still Easter season. 
Oh, I'll start. Pascal Candle Kitchen is the new Easter season. And we have, that's okay. And do you know, every Sunday we come to worship, look, the most important decoration we have is right behind me. You see on the altar how our cross is up higher than anything on the altar? The cross always has central space for us when we worship. It reminds us that Jesus died on the cross, just like Jack said, and it reminds us that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. And this pastoral candle that Mr. Tim is going to light is lit while we worship on during the season of Easter, and it's lit whenever people are baptized. It's a very special candle. So our candles at the altar are special. The flowers at the altar are special decorations. Don't we sing special music when we come to worship? Did you know that we exchange gifts with God every time we worship? I want you to think about that for a minute. When we come to worship, God gives us gifts. A while ago, Pastor reminded us that our sins are forgiven. And that reminds us that Jesus will come and take us to heaven one day. In just a few minutes, we'll get to hear someone read God's word, and Pastor will read God's word, and preach about God. Those are gifts from God. And, and we never hear God's word and gather together. God has given us things, but guess what? You know what's up? I'll offer that to you in just a few minutes. Not in the office, I'll go. Um, now, but do you know that we also give gifts to God when we come to worship? What in the world can we give to God? Now, some people bring gifts of money. You know, we bring food for people who are hungry. Those gifts. I hear just we give our very selves. We give God our love. We give God our thanks and our praise. When we pray to God and sing to God during worship, we're sharing our love for God. And even though you don't understand all the words sometimes, when you listen the very best you can, when you look all around and see all these beautiful reminders of God's love, and you think about how much God loves you, then you are able to give to God your love and thanks and praise too. Don't worry if you don't understand every word you hear. Because I'll tell you something. I don't understand every word I hear sometimes in Scripture. Or I don't understand everything I hear a pastor preach. Or I don't always understand fully a lot of things about God. God is so awesome and wonderful. We can't understand everything. It's not about understanding. It's about believing and it's about loving with all our hearts and souls and minds and strength. And guess what? Every one of you is able to do that. To use your eyes and ears and your voices during worship to show your love to God and your thank and praise. Pray with me, please. Lord God, we do love you so, and we thank you that you love us so much. We pray that you will help us to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind and strength, and to show forth our love and praise for you as we worship you each Sunday and all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now to help you celebrate this being the 43rd day of Easter and the sixth Sunday of Easter. Each of you can have an Easter egg and you can have two marbles. One for you and one to share with somebody else to help celebrate the joy of God's love. I ask for one thing. All this is sugar. Eat it when your mom and daddy say it's a good time to eat. It might not be a good time to do it during worship today, but I bet there'll be some time today that might be a good time. So then an Easter egg or two more. Happy Easter. It's still Easter. And after you get your treat, you know, go so up into that treat. Thanks for coming up. And for helping me. Y'all are good. Don't be sure that. Thank you for waiting for me. You want to get this? You want to release?
verses 12 through 26. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they, had, they were staying. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowds numbered about 120 persons, and said, Friends, the scripture has to be fulfilled with the Holy Spirit through David, foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in, in this ministry. Now, this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open at the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their language, a kildama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his homestead become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it, and let another take his position of overseer. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also known as Justice and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lots fell on Matthias. And he was added to the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. I can speak to God. We will now read responsibly the whole verse, Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. And all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like shadow of the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of righteousness. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The second reading is a reading from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9-15. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life, and that this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained that request made of him. The word of the Lord. I can speak to God. <laughs>
Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus prayed, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their, their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I've um, had several conversations this week, particularly at, at chapel on Wednesday, that sort of hung together, and, and um, I'm, I'm kind of speaking out of a meditative frame of mind this morning, so bear with me, um, but I think you'll see where I'm going. We all know that oysters will sometimes make pearls. That little factoid has illustrated many talking points, but what sometimes goes unmentioned is that they don't always do it. They don't automatically do it. In, in fact, uh, when an oyster, which, which must under ordinary circumstances lead a fairly uh, enviably calm and dull life, um, when an oyster somehow gets a bit of sand or grit inside its shell, one of two things is bound to happen. Either the oyster will create a pearl or it will die. The pearl, that, that precious thing of, of great beauty and value that Jesus said the merchant sold everything else to obtain, that pearl is a survival mechanism for the oyster. It's the oyster's way of staying alive after something very irritating and in fact deadly has gotten past its shell and into its heart. The gospel today comes from what's called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. We've, we've traveled back in time now to in the night in which he was betrayed, and Jesus is praying for his disciples, and through them for us. He prays for our unity, for our joy, our safety, and our protection. And he says that we are not of the world, but that we're going to remain in it nonetheless, for our ministry is to be for the world. Now, a little sidebar, when Jesus says the world, he doesn't mean, of course, the physical world of trees and rocks and bunnies and things like that. He's talking about human society. He's talking about our culture, its norms and institutions. And in particular, he's talking about the systems by which we organize ourselves and advance our own agendas. And he says to his disciples that the world has hated them because they are not of the world. This, this hatred is their faith, and indeed it's the distinguishing mark of all who follow Jesus, as if, as if it were tattooed on their forehead or on their forearms. Jesus' followers are destined to stand out because they do not and never will fit in. And I would say that this is the one thing with which we Christians really struggle. We don't fit in. What does it mean for us to be in the world, but not of the world? We have our faith. We have this hard shell of belief and conviction and determination, but hidden in soft and pleasant things, the world still manages to slip us a grain of sand, something very small but very rough that slips through our shells of faith and irritates. We need to work on that little bit of grit very carefully because it won't just go away. We'll either make a bit of pearl or die. And the basic grit inside us is this. When was the last time the world hated you because you belong to Christ and not to the world? 
When was the last time your faith set you apart from business as usual? When's the last time your conviction of belief drove you to take an action that earned you contempt? Ridicule. Faint annoyance. I don't like this question either. I don't, I don't like it because I know too well the times when I cannot square the compromises I make in order to survive in the world with the commitment I made to bear witness to the truth. I mean, maybe I've missed something. Maybe, maybe the kingdom of God really isn't all that hard. Maybe I'm just overeducated and underexperienced. Maybe the kingdom really is as simple and as convenient as we'd like it to be, but probably not. From time to time, I think we ought to ask ourselves if we have become so caught up in our culture, so totally aware of the world, that we've allowed ourselves to become of it, and ask ourselves what difference we make, if indeed we are any different. In a, in a way, things were easier for the early Christians than we're taught to think, because as a generally ignored and occasionally persecuted minority within Rome's pagan culture, lots of things were made clear to them through lists through potent lists. They couldn't attend public games. They couldn't join the army. They couldn't hold certain public offices or occupations. They were often ridiculed by their culture, their vision of the world, and they were sometimes made scapegoats. Um, take the Great Fire, for instance. In, in AD 64, a fire burned through Rome for more than a week, and it destroyed two-thirds of the city. And no one knows exactly how it started, but Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, says that Nero blamed the Christians for it. And that's what initiated the empire's first persecution against Christians. But you know, as long as they followed a few clear and strict guidelines, they were generally okay. For the most part, Rome didn't care about religion. What Rome cared about was order. The lines are not that clear these days. Some people still use you know, quick reference guides on popular things Christians shouldn't do. A lot of people think Christians shouldn't drink. Some people think Christians shouldn't dance or wear makeup or go to the movies or listen to popular music or whatever. And I may agree with them about the music. But generally, Lutherans don't fall into that category. In fact, we in the Episcopalians are usually gently chaffed for our jovial, prior, tough-like worldliness. But this makes us a little bit smug, too, even a little self-righteous about not being that kind of Christian. Oh, Lord, I thank you for not making me like that tax collector. But what if one of that kind of Christian were to say, okay, fine, drink your nasty beer and quote that fat bag of wind, Luther, till you turn purple, but first tell me how your faith affects your life. Can you put into any sensible words the difference that being Lutheran makes for you, the difference that it makes for you to be Christian at all? In today's world, it's a valid question. I mean, on one hand, I've known plenty of that kind of Christian who, however I might disagree with some of their theology, nevertheless had a palpable sense of what it meant for God to have lived in the world through his son and what he accomplished for the world through that son and what it meant for them to know the Holy Spirit was with us in the world. On the other hand, I've also known plenty, I've been one of plenty Christians who are, shall we say, more theologically relaxed, who were vague and ambivalent about their faith. And they have the feeling it's good for them, but they see no reason to risk censure from anyone by saying or doing anything weird. So there's the grid. And I know that like sand in the oyster, it does bother us. Because one way we try to deal with it is by trying to fix it so that there are no conflicts between faith and culture. That way we could be righteous and still enjoy business as usual. And in a way that's not a bad idea. We do need to engage the world and we should try very hard to make its institutions and its systems and ourselves better. We do need to do this. Christ himself commands us to do it. But at the same time, it's very easy to get confused about what engaging the world is supposed to mean, what, what purpose Christ intends for it to serve. Oysters don't survive by eating grit or by living on it. 
They survive by coping with it. When it comes to fixing the world, we often choose to support a cause that we think would be good for Christian reasons. But a lot of times we end up continuing to support it because we get personally invested. We get appointed to the board of the thing and we make new friends through it. And most dangerous of all, we actually start accomplishing something good through it, something at least that aligns with our sense of good. And sometimes it is indeed good. But one man's good can be another man's oppression. And we can get so invested in something that appears to be good for the whole that we can no longer see how we've abandoned Christ's mission and gone native. It's easy to forget that it's God who brings the kingdom, not us. The Lord does not call us to be powerful. The Lord does not call us to be effective, at least not in the way the world defines effectiveness. The Lord calls us to be faithful to him, to follow in his steps. Judas was effective. He was the one most able to handle money and pull the levers of organized society. And that may be what enabled him to work out the survival and ministry of Jesus and his band of followers. But in the end, he got the better of it. So fixing the world, no matter how important it might be, is not our pearl. So what is? What is our pearl then? Well, we don't have lists of rules telling us how not to be in the world because life is not this simple. Not even the Ten Commandments are a list. They aren't a checklist of discrete items. They properly orient our relationship to God and each other, and they outline the broad priorities of that relationship. But they don't provide a formula for being in the world but not of it. Now, the pearl, I think, is in the way we handle ourselves, our time, our money, all the things that we call mine, but which in reality aren't ours at all, and in what we choose to honor and serve through those things. It's in choices we make when no one is looking and when no other human being will ever know the difference. This, this side of God's kingdom, the world, as Jesus refers to it, this will always be ultimately the alternative to faithfulness. It will never be the route to it. So how do we do it? How do we conform our lives to Christ rather than to the world? How do we live faithfully and honestly? How do we act from integrity and rationale in the midst of a world that is far from God's kingdom? Moreover, how do we do it without either making too little of the tension between the world and what the gospel says or making too much of our response? I think it's a question of how to live. Do you ever remember, do you ever notice or wonder why it is that more and more people nowadays are trying to resolve deep personal hurt by turning to violence? I mean, society's always had misfit, but why does it seem like the ones in our time are lashing out with more frequency and causing greater tragedy? For what it's worth, my opinion is that they would do this lashing out regardless of the means. The real problem is this grit that is in all of us. Every single person, Christian and non-Christian alike. And the problem is that none of us are forming pearls around that grit. The world will always disappoint you. The world will always leave you hanging. It will always dump you. The world will always promise and never completely deliver. As Christians, we need to live our lives as pearls formed around the grit of that brokenness. We need to, in fact, be part of the grid that slips past other shells and triggers their pearl forming process. What good does it say? What good does it do for us to say, Jesus loves you, if we're not prepared to actually embody that love through the commitment and substance of relationship? If our belief doesn't bear fruit, what difference does it make if we have it? If we're not prepared to help others live, what difference does it make if we do? Most of us, and including me, are simply afraid. We're afraid that we'll fail or that people will take us the wrong way and think us weird. We are, in fact, wise to fear being misunderstood. Humans are very good at misjudging, and hate is born of misjudgment. But we still have to run these risks. 
We have to take a chance every day that we're going to be misunderstood failures. We have to take that grit and wrap the love of Christ around it patiently, quietly, unceasingly. And we have endless opportunities every day to do this. We have daily opportunities to look honestly at the world, at our institutions and our systems and ourselves, and respond in specific, prayerful, Christ-like ways. We probably will be hated by the world, or at the very least, misunderstood. But we will always offer our pearls to the Lord, and for Him, they are all forever pearls of great price. Amen. Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. God of all wisdom, be with all students and teachers who are finishing classes for the year. Be with all those who are graduating and moving on to whatever is next in their lives. Grant parents strength as their children leave home. Instill in all graduates a deep understanding of your call on their lives, so that they may serve you in all they do. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, in Christ Jesus, the joy of the church is made complete. Root the church in your word, 
and unify us as Christ's body. Give us thankful hearts for the many gifts of prayer, wisdom, and compassionate love that you have given this church family. Keep our bonds with each other strong and send us into the world as your loving people, ready to testify to your spirit at work. Lord, in your mercy. God of all creation, gather your people together from the four corners of the earth to be one in Christ, just as you and the Son and the Spirit are one. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all so that we may live together in faith, mutual care, and understanding. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Loving Lord, you are the source of all peace and healing for our lives. Instill in us your peace and newness of life through your Holy Spirit. We pray especially for Alan, Arlene, Gwen, Kathleen, James and Sylvia, Wayne and Dolores, Bob and Helen, Jean and Tammy, Delma, Edie, and Ruth. Comfort Rowanna and all the Boss family with your presence and sustain them with the sure and certain hope of resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us lift up our hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection appeared openly to his disciples and in their sight was taken up into heaven that he might make us partakers of his divine nature. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remember us in your kingdom, O Lord, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
the gifts of God for the people of God. And I speak to God. Please remove the seal on the wafer. You take it as I say, the body of Christ given for you. Amen. Amen. Turn it over and remove the other seal. And join me as I say, the blood of Christ shed for you. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Almighty God, you gave your son both as a sacrifice for sin and as a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
honoring the Lord.